have no idea. But my subscriber says we have 650,000 subscribers. How many listen, how many watch, that's none of my business. That's between the Lord and the viewers. So without further ado, my brother, come introduce yourself and lead us in the program. All right, stick around here, Pastor, because I'd like you to do the invocation. God comes first, then country. Amen. All right, would you mind? Didn't know I was going to have to go to work that quick. <laughs> I was going to sit down and retire for a few minutes. A number of years ago, some deacons decided to try to get rid of me because I was getting so politically involved, and uh, God got rid of them later, but uh, they decided they were going to get rid of me, and they said, why don't you just retire? And I was on a trip with my wife down to uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and we stopped there and had uh, food at, uh, at the Cracker Barrel, and I sat on the porch out there in a rocking chair, and I asked a lady, I said, can I buy one of these? She said, yeah, we'll even ship it to California for you. So I shipped that rocking chair to California, and uh, it's around here somewhere, but I set it up here on the stage, and that Sunday morning when the deacons walked in, I said, I'm retiring. And they said, great, he's retiring. And I said, here's my retirement rocker, and I've been retired in that rocker ever since. So anyway, let's go to the Lord in prayer because my brother's right. God comes first. God and country. By the way, when you go vote, you can vote for Hillary, you can vote for Trump, or you can go down to the bottom and write in Wiley Drake. <laughs> it's there. It's available. I was on the California ballot. We will be on the federal ballot if they ever get their book work squared away. But that's his job, and I won't go into that. But uh, you can vote for me, Wiley Drake. And uh, I have two planks in the platform. I know I'm getting political, brother, but two planks in the platform. King James Bible, Constitution. That's it. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Allow me the privilege to lead you in this prayer, please. I will answer God's call to fall on my knees in humility and seek his face in repentance so that he might forgive my sins and heal our land. Lord, may the words of our mouths and the meditations of our heart be acceptable in your sight here today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. Okay. Paul, I'm going to ask you to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Everybody stand, please. to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Well, we have a small but important crowd here today, and the reason, I suppose, is because I scheduled this on a Tuesday during the day when people generally work. We have a Los Angeles event tonight, which is sold out very well. And you're welcome to come up to the Lux Hotel uh, in Los Angeles for that event at 7 p.m. as well, uh, where uh, Ken, Kenneth Timmerman, our, our guest, and uh, Nikula Basili, Nikula will also be appearing. Um, about three years ago, I was introduced to Nikula uh, through a mutual contact who uh, didn't tell me why he wanted to meet with me. And uh, I met with him, and before long he had retained me as his attorney. Uh, but things didn't work out, and uh, uh, we went our separate ways. It had always been my hope, though, to be able to introduce him, because in my view, he is the first political prisoner in the United States for engaging in Islamic blasphemy. And that's something that we ought to be very concerned about because under a Hillary Clinton administration, that may apply to all of us at some point in our lives and we all may be put to, to punishment uh, because of our expression of our faith and our belief that is Islamism is a threat to the Judeo-Christian fabric of this country. Now, Pastor Drake, uh, 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 said he's running for um, president if you'll sign him in. 
uh, or write them in. And uh, of course, I've said some nasty things about Hillary Clinton. And under the Johnson Amendment, I am not permitted as a 501c3 nonprofit public interest law firm to endorse a candidate either directly or indirectly, or to even say anything bad about a candidate. But how does that happen when the purpose and the mission of Freedom X is to protect the expressive rights of conservatives and Christians? How is it possible that the government can tell me not to say who you need to know, uh, what you need to know about these candidates? Now, today you're going to hear from Ken Timmerman, who is a New York Times bestselling author of many books on Jesse Jackson, on Iran's nuclear ambitions, on Benghazi, on uh, the French betrayal of America, and numerous other subjects. Uh, he's a prolific author, and we're happy to have him out here uh, to uh, talk about his book and also to engage in a question and answer period with Nikula. Now, Nikula is sort of hard to understand, and we didn't bring a translator except for Ken, and Ken's going to do his best. So if you have any questions or if you don't understand what's being said, feel free to speak up or wait until your chance to be able to question them, uh, because we're going to give you that time to do that as well. Uh, some of you here are members of Act for America, and I'm familiar with you, and others I'm not familiar with. Um, but I'd like to just very briefly, before introducing Ken, let you know what our mission is. You see these, these uh, banners behind me tell you we protect conservative and religious freedom of expression. Freedom X is shorthand for freedom of expression. Um, and we ask that you express yourself. And what we're, we're trying to do is, as a public interest law firm, yeah, we file lawsuits. We win some lawsuits. We lose some but we attract attention. If you've heard about the Santa Monica nativity scene case or the boys who wore their American flag t-shirts on Cinco de Mayo at high school in Northern California or uh, people who are discriminated against in the workplace uh, at JPL and elsewhere, we step in and help them. I'm an ADF trained attorney, ADF allied attorney, that's the Alliance Defending Freedom. And a dozen years ago, they trained me and urged me to start my own nonprofit. And so we are trying to do the work that so many others need to do. And that's why we say, go out there and express your conservative values, beliefs, and your viewpoints. And if it puts you in a position where you are having your life threatened or your jobs threatened or your uh, reputation threatened, or people are threatening you with violence because of that expressive right, then you come to us. And uh, we'll do what we can to try to, to uh, do things through the legal process. But at the same time, we want to be a voice for you. And we want to be able to, and we do this nationwide. We have cases around the country. Um, but we're based in Los Angeles. And we will try to build initiatives through the incidents that you may be exposed to. So that's what Freedom X does. And I hope you'll get to know us by going to our website, freedomxlaw.com. Don't forget the law, freedomxlaw.com. And take a look at it. We update it every day to include news, links to stories that are important to anybody who is concerned about how we as conservatives and Christians are losing our rights in this country. Um, so it's a very good informational page to go to our home page. Well, now I'd like to introduce Ken Timmerman. And I, I don't know, is Bakula nearby? Is he? Okay. Um, Ken is going to initially discuss his book, um, Deception, the YouTube video that Hillary and Obama blame for Benghazi. Is there anybody here who is not familiar with that period of time when on 9-11-2012 when the Obama administration uh, claimed that it was a YouTube video that caused Ambassador Chris Stevens in Benghazi, Libya and three other Americans to die and they went on national television and blamed it on that video. Is there anybody here who does not remember that? Okay, so this is an informed crowd and what's interesting is that Ken went to the trouble 
of really researching and really digging deep into this fraud, this fraud on the American public. These lies that are told by this administration, the lies that Hillary told to a Pakistani audience on Pakistani TV when she threw the First Amendment under the bus and uh, was critical of Nikula's video, uh, have, been, have been eaten up by the media and of course swallowed whole by the gullible uh, population of this country. And this hasn't been their first lie. If you remember when Bill Clinton wagged his fingers at us on TV and squinted and said, I never had sex with that Miss Lewinsky, and you knew he was lying at the time, you have to ask yourself, what motivates these liars? And how do they go about getting away with it? Well, Ken went to the trouble of investigating it. I'm going to let him tell you some of the ins and outs. But I was really surprised reading his book just how deliberate the plan was to try to cover up the failures of this administration in Libya and uh, get Obama reelected. That was the whole point, to cover up uh, the misdeeds in Libya so that he would not have to answer those failures on the campaign trail four years ago. So Ken, it's a real pleasure to have you here. I'm going to introduce you, and after uh, some time, he's going to uh, bring Nikula up to the stage, and they're going to have a Q&A. Thanks very much. Well, thank you, Bill Becker, and thank you, Freedom X. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Thank you, Pastor Drake, who has wandered off someplace. Oh, there you are, Pastor Drake. Thank you for your prayers this morning, your introduction, and also your hospitality in having us here. Uh, I'd like to kind of give you a uh, few of the takeaways from my book, Deception, uh, the making of the YouTube video that Hillary and Obama blamed for Benghazi. Before I get to that, I've got to tell you about my earlier book, because this is really the second book I've done on Benghazi. Uh, when I woke up the next morning, like I'm sure many of you did uh, on September 12, 2012, and you saw uh, that we had just lost four Americans in a, a brutal, obviously a terrorist attack in Benghazi, Libya. I, I said to myself, something is going on here that we are not being told. <laughs> there, there is something behind this that is very serious, that is very deep uh, for a terrorist group to take the risk, take the risk of attacking the United States of America, because that's what they did. Uh, and, and it has not happened very often uh, in my lifetime, right? There was a U.S. ambassador killed in Lebanon in the 1970s, another one uh, killed in Afghanistan, I think it was 79. Uh, our, our diplomats were taken hostage in Tehran in 1979. I was on the ground in Beirut as a young reporter in April of 1983 when uh, the Iranians, as it turns out, attacked our embassy in Beirut, blew it up, uh, and killed uh, uh, quite a number of people on the ground. But it doesn't happen that often. You know, Osama bin Laden blew up two embassies in Africa in 1998, and since then there has not been this type of attack. Because it's risky. If you attack the United States of America, it's risky. Uh, and so I woke up on the 12th of September and I said, hmm, something, something is going on here. It's clearly not because of a YouTube video. There's something going on. And I started to investigate, uh, called in all of my sources. Uh, eventually, as you'll find in this earlier book, Dark Forces, I went to defectors from Iranian intelligence, people that I had worked with uh, in cases, uh, terrorism cases against the Iranian regime, uh, notably the 9-11 attacks. And I asked them if they had heard anything at all about this uh, Iranian Red Crescent team that had arrived in Benghazi six weeks before the attacks and been kidnapped and taken off the streets and disappeared. And then, oh, goodness gracious, they just reappeared uh, three weeks later and went home. And uh, bit by bit, as I started pulling those threads, I found out that uh, this was well known inside the Iranian intelligence community, even to defectors, and they gave, started giving me names, each one a different name. And I tracked those names down, and I found out that this was, in fact, a Iranian regime attack. They had sent a hit team to Benghazi, uh, recruited local agents. The local agents carried out the attack, and then the Iranians just vanished. A very typical type of thing. So there's a deception there as well. 
right? They deceived the CIA. Uh, as I finished that book called Dark Forces, there was the one thing I had not gone into in some detail, and that was the YouTube video. Uh, we all were hearing from the news how uh, Mrs. Clinton repeated the... Um, Okay. Well, we can we can do that. You want to you want me to pause and we can do that. Okay. And then you can see what uh, you'll, you. I won't have to go through some of that story. So uh, we'll we'll do it from the video. All right. It's ten minutes long, so we'll cut it. Okay. Uh, right. Department and for our country. We've seen the heavy assault on our post in Benghazi that took the lives of those brave men. We've seen rage and violence directed at American embassies over an awful internet video. This video is disgusting and reprehensible. It appears to have a deeply cynical purpose to denigrate a great religion and to provoke rage. Let's be clear, these protests were in reaction to a video that had spread to the region. You had a video that was released by somebody who lives here, sort of a shadowy character, who is an extremely offensive video. The unrest we've seen has been in reaction to a video. It was a crude and disgusting video, sparked outrage throughout the Muslim world. The chair would now recognize a gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Victoria Newland, your spokesperson at the State Department, hours after the attack said this, Benghazi has been attacked by militants in Cairo, Police have removed demonstrators. Benghazi, you got weapons and explosions. Cairo, you got spray paint and rocks. One hour before the attack in Benghazi, Chris Stevens walks a diplomat to the front gate. The ambassador didn't report a demonstration. He didn't report it because it never happened. An eyewitness in the command center that night on the ground said no protest, no demonstration. Two intelligence reports that day. No protest, no demonstration. The attack starts at 3.42 Eastern Time, ends at approximately 11.40 p.m. that night. At 4.06, an ops alert goes out across the State Department. It says this, mission under attack, armed men, shots fired, explosions heard. No mention of a video, no mention of a protest, no mention of a demonstration. But the best evidence is Greg Hicks, the number two guy in Libya, the guy who worked side by side with Ambassador Stevens. He was asked if there had been a protest would the ambassador have reported it? Mr. Hicks' response, absolutely. For there to have been a demonstration on Chris Stevens' front door and him not to have reported it is unbelievable, Mr. Hicks said. He said, secondly, if it had been reported, he would have been out the back door within minutes and there was a back gate. Everything points to a terrorist attack. We just heard from Mr. Pompeo about the long history of terrorist incidents, terrorist violence in the country. And yet five days later, Susan Rice goes on five TV shows, and she says this. This was not a pre-planned, premeditated uh, attack. That what happened initially was that it was a spontaneous uh, reaction to what had just transpired in Cairo uh, as a consequence of the video. So, if there's no evidence for a video-inspired protest, then where'd the false narrative start? Started with you, Madam Secretary. At 10.08, on the night of the attack, you released this statement. Some have sought to justify the vicious behavior as a response to inflammatory material posted on the internet. At 10.08, with no evidence, at 10.08, before the attack is over, at 10.08, when Tyrone Woods and Glenn Doherty are still on the roof of the annex fighting for their lives, the official statement of the State Department blames a video. Why? If you look at what I said, I referred to the video that night in a very specific way. I said some have sought to justify the attack because of the video. I used those words deliberately, not to ascribe a motive to every attacker, but as a warning to those across the region. 
uh, that uh, there was no justification for further attacks. And in fact, uh, during the course of that week, uh, we had many attacks that were all about the video. We had people breaching the walls of our embassies in Tunis and Khartoum. We had people, Absolutely. thankfully not Americans, dying at uh, protests, but that's what was going on, Congressman. Secretary Clinton, I appreciate most of those attacks were after the attack on the uh, facility in, in Benghazi. You mentioned Cairo. It was interesting, what else Ms. Uh, Ms. Newland said that day? She said, uh, if pressed by the press, if there's a connection between Cairo and Benghazi, she said this, there's no connection between the two. So here's what troubles me. Your experts knew the truth. Your spokesperson knew the truth. Greg Hicks knew the truth. But what troubles me more is I think you knew the truth. I want to show you a few things here. You're looking at an email you sent to your family. Here's what you said. At 11 o'clock that night, approximately one hour after you told the American people it was a video, you say to your family, two officers were, were, were killed today in Benghazi by an Al-Qaeda-like group. You tell, you tell the American people one thing, you tell your family an entirely different story. Also, on the night of the attack, you had a call with the president of Libya. Here's what you said to him. Ansar al-Sharia is claiming responsibility. Interesting, Mr. Katala, one of the guys arrested and charged, actually belonged to that group. And finally, and most significantly, the next day, within 24 hours, you had a conversation with the Egyptian Prime Minister. You told him this, we know the attack in Libya had nothing to do with the film. It was a planned attack, not a protest. Let me read that one more time. We know. Not we think, not it might be. We know the attack in Libya had nothing to do with the film. It was a planned attack, not a protest. State Department experts knew the truth. You knew the truth, but that's not what the American people got. And again, the American people want to know why. Why didn't you tell the American people exactly what you told the Egyptian prime minister? Well, I think if you look at the statement that I made, I clearly said that it was an attack, and I also said that there were some who tried to justify Secretary it Clinton, on, the basis, on the basis of the video, Congressman. And I but, think but, it's... But, 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 real quick, calling it an attack is like saying the sky's blue. Of course it was an attack. Well, you know, I mean, it we want to know the truth. That this, the statement you sent out was a statement on Benghazi, and you say vicious behavior as a response to inflammatory material on the Internet. If that's not pointing as the motive of being a video, I don't know what is. And that's certainly what, and that's certainly how the American people saw it. Well, well, Congressman, there was a lot of conflicting information that we were trying to make sense of. The situation was very fluid; it was fast moving. Of it, Madam Secretary. And so all I there can say not is conflicting, nobody. There was not conflicting information the day of the attack because your press secretary said, if pressed, there's no connection between Cairo and Benghazi. It was clear. You're the ones who muddied it up, not the not the information. Well, there's no connection. Here's what, here's what I think. That, here's what I think is going on. Here's what I think is going on. Let me show you one more slide. Again, this is from Victoria Nolan, your press person. She says to Jake Sullivan, Philippe Rhinus, subject line reads this, Romney's statement on Libya. Email says, this is what Ben was talking about. I assume Ben is the now somewhat famous Ben Rhodes author of the Talking Points Memo. This email is at 1035, 27 minutes after your 1008 statement. 27 minutes after you've told everyone it's a video, while Americans are still fighting because the attack's still going on, your top people are talking politics. Seems to me that night you had three options, Secretary. You could tell the truth, like you did with your family, like you did with the Libyan president, like you did with the Egyptian prime minister, Tell them it was a terrorist attack. You could say, you know what, we're not quite sure. Don't, don't really know for sure. I don't, I don't think the evidence is there. I think it's all in the person, but you could have done that. But you picked a third option. You picked the video narrative. You picked the one with no evidence. And you did it because Libya was supposed to be, as Mr. Rossman pointed out, this great success story for the Obama White House and the Clinton State Department. And a key campaign theme that year was GM's alive, Bin Laden's dead, Al-Qaeda's on the run. And now you have a terrorist attack. 
It's a terrorist attack in Libya. And it's just 56 days before an election. You can live with a protest about a video. That won't hurt you. But a terrorist attack will. So you can't be square with the American people. Tell your family it's a terrorist attack, but not the American people. You can tell the president of Libya it's a terrorist attack, but not the American people. And you can tell the Egyptian prime minister it's a terrorist attack, but you can't tell your own people the truth. Madam Secretary, Americans can live with the fact that good people sometimes give their lives for this country. They don't like it. They mourn for those families, they pray for those families, but they can live with it. But what they can't take, what they can't live with, is when their government's not square with them. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. <laughs> Madam Secretary, you're welcome to answer the question if you would like to. Well, I wrote a whole chapter about this in my book, Hard Choices. I'd be glad to send it to you, Congressman, because I think the insinuations uh, that you are making do a grave disservice to the hard work that people in the State Department, the intelligence community, the Defense Department, the White House did during the course of some very confusing and difficult days. Secretary Clinton, you said my insinuation. I'm not insinuating anything. I'm, I'm reading what you said. Plain language. We know the attack in Libya had nothing to do with the film. That's as plain as it can get. That's vastly different than vicious behavior justified by internet material. Why didn't you just speak plain? the American people. I did. <laughs> Good. Very, very, very well done. And I just want to say that Ken's book goes in much deeper detail. Yeah. No, that, that's perfect. I'm glad that you played this that. This has been a difficult week. I'm glad you played that, Bill. State right. Department and for our country. Stop that now. We've seen I know. We've seen heavy assault on our Like I said, video is not my Benghazi job, you know. It took the lives. Bingo, gone. All right. Uh, so that lays out the chronology for you of Mrs. Clinton's lies on the night of the attack and what she actually knew uh, had taken place. And uh, a couple of things I'll, I'll add to that, and then I want to go directly into the revelations here in my book, Deception. Uh, at the time the attack took place, nobody had seen this video in Libya. It was a non-issue. The uh, journalists who first reported it, and I go into great detail how they first reported it, where they learned the information, how they were able to get such detailed information about Nakula, for example, within hours of this attack. Nobody knew who Nakula was, but they all of a sudden knew on the morning of September 12th, oh, we know everything about this guy. We know his past uh, criminal record. We know this. Uh, we know where he's living. We know that he made this movie. Uh, we know how he must be a terrible person. And they said all kinds of things about him, including a few lies I'll tell you about in a second. Uh, they were fed information. And the website that they were given, the YouTube video uh, channel that they were given to go look at his movie, it had how many, think, how many views? Anybody have an idea? Those who haven't read my book, 100,000, a million? Very popular. Everybody was watching this in the Middle East, according to Hillary. It had 450 views, 405, 450 views at the time of the attacks in Benghazi. In other words, nobody had seen it. Nobody had seen it. Now, I know that doesn't please Nikula. He would have liked many more people to see it. Uh, and, and I know he was trying very hard to get attention in Egypt, and, and he did get some attention in Egypt on a Salavist TV network. But uh, the YouTube channel that the U.S. government pointed the journalists to had 405 views. It was a non-issue. It did not exist. Now, that's a problem. I remember uh, the next day, I was looking for this video on, on the internet, some of you probably were too, and it was kind of hard to find, wasn't it, the first day? Uh, it was only until the 13th that it started to get a lot easier. And then you'd type in Mohammed movie, or you'd type in uh, Benghazi uh, video, or something like that, and then it would pop up. And I began to wonder why that was. And as I investigated, and I had some help from uh, the lawyers who were representing one of the actresses uh, in the, who was in the movie, and, um, uh, and some people that they had hired who specialize in tracking 
the, the, how things go viral on the inter internet. It turns out that somebody set up a very special YouTube channel called News Politics Now just to promote this video. And they used some very sophisticated marketing techniques uh, with word searches and other things that would key it to the news to help people to find it. And they, obviously, this was the, the, uh, the version that was in English, the original version of the video. And with the help of this News Politics Now YouTube channel, then it skyrocketed. The first day, 300,000 hits. The next day, a million hits. The day after that, three million hits. I've got a whole chart. We, we track the whole thing in the book. You've got the numbers in the book. After about a week, it had 10 million views on this particular YouTube channel. It had gone viral. Amazing. It was all over the world. And it's very true, Mrs. Clinton mentioned that there were other attacks, right? This is part of the deception. They needed the YouTube video to go viral. They needed there to be other attacks around the world so that the one attack that was not caused by the YouTube video would not be noticed. In other words, nobody would be thinking that something else happened in Benghazi. They'd be thinking, oh, of course, it's the YouTube video, because look, the YouTube video has, has uh, caused all these others. It's called Mastrovka. Okay, that's an old Soviet term. You know, the old days, uh, communists had things called disinformatia. And this is what they were doing. They needed us to be looking over here at the YouTube video. Keep your eyes on the YouTube video. Don't look over here in Benghazi where we're shipping arms to terrorists. So the whole thing was a deception operation to trick and delude, to deceive the American people. So we would not ask the questions that needed to be asked about what was actually happening in Benghazi. Just focus on the video, folks. Focus on this evil, terrible person. Focus on him, quote, slandering a great religion. And, and don't ask the questions that really need to be asked. Why did we have a CIA annex in Benghazi? <laughs> what were those guys doing and women doing? Uh, why did the ambassador get sent to Benghazi on the 11th, on the 10th of September for the anniversary of the 11th of September? Why was he meeting with the, uh, uh, the uh, Turkish uh, consul in Benghazi, who is, as I also go through in the book, the guy is clearly an intelligence officer. You know, you go through his profile, he's an intelligence officer. He works for MIT, which is the Turkish Intelli Military Intelligence Service, okay? Why was he meeting also with a shipping agent? He's the ambassador. Why would the ambassador be meeting with a shipping agent? Well, he's meeting in a shipping, with a shipping agent because the weapon shipments from Benghazi to Syria via Turkey had been really screwed up. <laughs> they, the shipping agents were no good, and they became public. And so that secret operation that they had going in Benghazi risks unraveling. So, so Hillary sent the ambassador to Benghazi to meet with the Turkish consul, to meet with another shipping agent so they could get the whole thing under wraps. And then the attack happened and she, I mean, she admitted, I'm sure, many expletives, uh, as, as she has, is wont to do, got her people together and they, figured, they tried to figure out how they were gonna blame it on the video. We know now that at 7.30 that night, 7.30 p.m., Mrs. Clinton, uh, her office had just received a, um, uh, an email from the Pentagon from, the, uh, uh, from a guy named Jeremy Bash. He, was the, uh, he ran the office for the Secretary of Defense. And the email said, we have all of these assets around the world, these military assets, special forces in, uh, in Crete, not very far away in Croatia, and another place, and they are, quote, spinning up as we speak. So we've got help for the people in Benghazi while the attacks are going on. That's what the Pentagon was telling Mrs. Clinton. We've got help. They're spinning up as we speak. Just need your sign off. Instead of signing off on the let's send the troops, let's send some rescue squad to the people in Benghazi, she went into a two-hour meeting, a secure video teleconference with political hacks at the White House. And we now know that when she, they, they spent that time not trying to figure out how they could rush forces to Benghazi to save the people on the ground who were still under fire. But they came out with 10 talking points. Five of them had to do with the video. And how are we gonna to manage to blame everything that's happening on the video? Five of them involved the cover-up. And the other five were all about 
how we keep those military forces from spinning up, so we'll spin them down. How do we slow roll the military forces going to Benghazi? And ultimately, none of them went there. There were no military reinforcements to Benghazi that night besides Glenn Doherty and the couple of people that he rounded up in Tripoli that night. Okay. There were, as I said, 85 very real attacks that were caused by this video because Islam is a religion of peace, as we all know, and uh, when Muslims were angry, they went out and murdered people. Um, so there were 85 very uh, real attacks. 83 of them were caused by the video. Two of them were not. The two that were not were the first one in Cairo, which was a demonstration led by the brother of the leader of Al-Qaeda and the son of the blind sheikh. They were going to burn down the embassy. They announced it ahead of time. And they wanted us in the United States to release the blind sheikh. So that was not caused by the video. And the Benghazi attack was not caused by the video. But there were 83 real attacks that happened later. 40, or more than 40 people were killed over the next two weeks. So in the mind of the people, this video was really deadly. Of course, it must have caused Benghazi. That's what they were trying to do. It was the deception on the American people. Uh, a second thing that I found as I was investigating this is Hillary's email slowly came out. We learned that uh, she had gotten a long, long uh, kind of game plan laying out the deception, laying out the blame it on the video narrative from a former White House aide named Sid Blumenthal. Sid Blumenthal is the guy who invented the vast right-wing conspiracy, right, in the 1990s. I was a proud member at the time. I worked for the American Spectator. Uh, I didn't know I was a member of the vast right-wing conspiracy until Sid told me. But it was really, it's kind of fun to wake up that day and find it out. Sid laid out for her in this long email exactly how they would blame the attacks in Benghazi on the uh, YouTube video that Nakula made. And his son Max would write the first article. And dutifully, son Max, who's a notorious anti-Semite, by the way, son Max penned his piece. It appeared early the next morning, and I go into some detail of the various allegations that he made, uh, including a, uh, a false story that was planted by the media, made up whole cloth. Uh, Steve Klein, who's here in the back, uh, talked to me about this quite some bit uh, when I was researching the book, uh, but there were reporters that just made stuff up. They pretended, uh, they, they claimed that Nakula was an Israeli Jew uh, living in the United States. They claimed he had, a, he had 500 Jewish donors, completely false. Steve didn't tell him that. Nakula didn't tell him that. Didn't tell the reporters that. They made it up whole cloth. But all this made it in the way into the story that Max Blumenthal put out the next morning and then became the, 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 the narrative. That became the narrative. It was picked up by reporters everywhere. Now, why did, did Hillary have another motive in this? And the reason that Bill Becker is co-sponsoring this event today with Pastor Drake is because he's, he cares about religious freedom, he cares about freedom of speech, and she ca he cares about something called the Istanbul process. Uh, the Istanbul process uh, was something that Mrs. Clinton, as Secretary of State, was deeply engaged in with leaders of the 57 Muslim states of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. It's called the Istanbul process because that's where some of the key meetings happened. And it led to a UN General Assembly resolution, Resolution 1618, that called on all the member states of the United Nations essentially to shut down freedom of speech if Muslims were offended. So the, the, the wording of the, the resolution is very careful. Uh, it, you, know, you could read it as if, well, we're just saying we should apply our own laws and you shouldn't outlaw this particular type of speech but then Hillary Clinton makes clear in the emails, we're going to call it hate speech, and we're going to use our hate speech laws. So if somebody speaks about Islam in a way that Muslims don't like, we're going to call it hate speech, and we're going to throw them in jail. The first victim of that resolution 1618 is going to be with us here in a couple of minutes, Nakula. Another thing that I looked into was the role of Google, Google and YouTube. Uh, they were the ones, obviously, that uh, provided the platform where this uh, YouTube video was, was broadcast. They made a lot of money off it. You know, 10 million hits, they're, they're, making, they're making money, so they have an in interest to keep the movie up. Well, one of the actresses sued them 
to say, look, I'm getting blamed. People are blaming me for Benghazi. That's the way she felt. Would you please take it down because I'm getting death threats? And Google and YouTube wouldn't do that. They falsely pretended that they were defending freedom of speech. They weren't defending freedom of speech. Believe me, they were not defending freedom of speech. We now know that there were many, many email exchanges between Mrs. Clinton and Google and YouTube executives. So they wanted to keep the movie up online to maintain the deception on the American people, to maintain the de deception on the world that it was that YouTube video that caused the Benghazi attacks. That's the only reason that was their only interest. But Google spent probably $2 million defending the lawsuit. They ultimately won and kept the movie online uh, where you know, it, it had the impact that, he had, that it had. And the final thing before we bring Nikola in here, uh, I want to uh, mention to you in the book, uh, at the very end, after I go through the making of the movie and how it went viral and how the administration used it to cover up and to deceive the American people, uh, I go into a, uh, you know, more documents are being released all the time, so I'm going to get the most recent documents uh, into the book. And uh, there's a very important Defense Intelligence Agency report that uh, Judicial Watch obtained in March of this year. They didn't know what to do with it. They gave it to me. They said, Ken, you know, can you make heads or tails of this and explain what it was? And it was a uh, response to a tasking order from the uh, head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, at that time General Michael Flynn. You know, Michael Flynn now is engaged in one of the presidential campaigns. Uh, you will probably recognize him and know which one he's uh, working for. Uh, and uh, the tasking order went out days after the Benghazi attacks, and General Flynn says to all of his components at the DIA, give me what you got. What do you know about A, the al-Qaeda involvement in the attacks, and B, about the Iranian Quds Force involvement in the attacks. He asks ex specifically, and that's the one part of the document that is not redacted, specifically, what do we know in the Defense Intelligence Agency about the Quds Force involvement, and what do we know about the al-Qaeda involvement? I talked to General Flynn about this, he couldn't go into great, great detail, but he did uh, confirm to me that he was well aware of the Red Crescent team and that the Defense Intelligence Agency and the U.S. intelligence community was well aware that the Iranian Red Crescent team was in Benghazi and that they had used, the Iranian intelligence had used Red Crescent, which is the Muslim form of the Red Cross, right? It's the Muslim Red Cross, uh, but it's kind of not really like the Red Cross. Uh, in, in Gaza, for example, the Red Crescent ambulances uh, will take wounded people around. They'll also take RPG-7s around in crates of ammunition, you know, from one place to another. And the Israelis won't hit them because it's an ambulance. But, so in, in Libya, the Iranians sent their operations team to Benghazi under cover of the Red Crescent Society. When they found out that the CIA was onto them, that the CIA knew who they were, actually had people tailing them, they staged a kidnapping by their own people, by the people that they had trained and equipped, the local Libyan militia, took them off the streets. The agency was fooled, so the Iranians deceived the CIA. That was another deception, as I mentioned earlier. They deceived the CIA and were able to continue their preparations for this attack on September 11th, uh, 2012. So now we know in this document that General Flynn is essentially uh, uh, asking the DIA what we know about this. He's not doing it because he just kind of has an idea. He's asking DIA what they know about the Quds Force involvement because he's seen the reports. He wants them to put it all together into analysis at the end. The two page, the, the response is five pages. The first two pages are all about Iran and the Quds Force completely redacted. Not a word emerges. So there's two pages of gee, we don't know anything about Iran's involvement in Benghazi. Two whole page, it took two pages for them to say that. I, really? <laughs> and then there's three pages, with, which is mostly redacted, which talks a bit about al-Qaeda. So you can see that they're following al-Qaeda as well. 
but there's two whole pages about the Iranian involvement. So I thought that that was very important. It was important to include that. That is part and parcel of the deception, part and parcel of Mrs. Clinton's deception on the American people. Don't forget, she went from there to open that secret back channel to the Iranian regime that led to the Iran nuclear deal, which is such a disaster. And if she had admitted publicly or allowed the DIA to speak publicly about Iran's involvement in Benghazi, they never could have done the nuclear deal. They never could have done it. Nobody would have swallowed it. Nobody in Congress would have swallowed it. So this is all of a piece, comrades. <laughs> there is nothing that happened by coincidence. It was all very carefully scripted and, and planned out. Once the attack happened, I don't think they knew about the attack ahead of time. I'm not saying that. But once the attack happened, they put together a plan very quickly, blame the video, blame the Kula, and oh, just in case he might get the idea to start talking to people, let's throw him in jail. So Nikula, I hope that you're there and that you can uh, come here with us. And uh, I would like to get him to um, ask, I'd like to ask Nikula some questions and get him to share his own experience and what happened with him uh, as the first victim of Hillary Clinton's uh, Islamic uh, blasphemy laws. Pardon me for the interruption. They will be bringing Nikula in, but let me just tell you, you know, sandwiched in here. Yes. On September the 27th, the federal government contacted me and said, we know you take in people into your sanctuary, and we have a man that we put in a halfway house in San Diego. The halfway house has said no because they found out who he was and that they would blow up the whole halfway house just to get to him. And his family lived close by here. And so they said, uh, will you take him in? So on September the 27th, Brother Nakula, come, come, come on over, Brother. Uh, on September the 27th, I had the privilege to meet with him and the federal government, and he's been a resident here in our homeless shelter and refuge now for more than three years. And uh, he's also my brother in Christ. And so God bless you, my brother. Go ahead. All right, so. Yeah. So what I'd like to do is ask you if you could uh, share with us, share with the people here, your experiences after the night of September 11th, the night of the attacks in Benghazi. So tell us, tell us what happened to you. Yeah. Tell us what happened to your family. Actually, thank you for everybody. You know you are here. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to share with you in September 11, I think 10 or 11, I felt my hand is full with the blood. I believed, personally, I believed my uh, video is the reason. And uh, after that, I hide it from the media completely because I feel shy. Uh, Later on, they put me in jail for stupid reason or whatever, I don't mind. And also, I learned from this accident is, when you can do something, God not involved doesn't mean nothing. The video, like I heard, is 400 views. But when God put his hand, is millions. Uh, I, le I learned a lot of th stuff from that, a lot of things of that. A uh, lie doesn't go far. Lie sometimes or some in some point it will stop. Uh, what you need me to say? Well, no. I, I, I would like you to describe what it was like to look out the window of your house and see the media people in your front lawn. Okay, in front of this is I found they, they told me it's around 1,200 uh, TV station and the journalist and all of this is front of the house, more than that. And uh, actually the kids was scary. They didn't go to the schools. They didn't go to the university. Uh, my father was 86 years old. Uh, he came from Egypt. He lived all his life in Egypt. He was really scared. He never find that. When he o we opened the TV, we find breaking news everywhere. That's me and I don't know. I didn't mean that. When we made the movie, I made it for something specific. The movie, still I have it. I still have the movie. It's more than two hours movie. For 13 minutes, this has happened. I don't know what's happening when I release the other two hours movie. Uh, 
I hope nobody get killed, especially American, Egyptian, any, any human being. I don't hope this is, could be happened again. Yeah, they, were, they were pounding on his door. Uh, they were you know, claiming yeah, that he was- Yeah, the media, yeah, the media. The media was pounding the media, on his door. Yeah, the media, yeah. uh, And at a certain point, you took off the lock, and you took off the handle so they yes. couldn't actually open the door and come yes. in because they were trying to open the door to break into his house. Yeah, okay. To really, I, 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 could, I could not, you know, I don't like to remember these days. It was very, very bad days. Right, and then there's a famous picture of you coming out of the house at night. Yeah, this up. is, I cover, I cover my, my head not because I'm shy or anything, no. I covered my head because I don't like the, my family in Egypt to get hurt. I don't like to know who I am. I left Egypt more than 37 years, you know, but I have, still I have family over there. I have a people over there. I was worried about them because it's, you know, people is crazy. The, the violence is very, very crazy right. people, you know. It's, and then the police call this protective custody they took him yeah. into protective custody. And tell us about that. Did, where did they put you they in protective custody? They put me, custody? I told them, okay, I am, I am a big criminal in the world. They put me in jail. They said no. They put me in two, uh, one yard by two yard for eight months. Uh, I spent, they call it a special housing unit. I didn't take a shower or shave or cut my nails for four months. And I have a picture for that. I have a picture for that. When I asked, they said, no hot water. And in Christmas time, I cannot take a shower without hot water. Uh, that's why I didn't shave, I didn't take a shower, I didn't cut my nail four months from September 27 until uh, end of January until I went to Texas, and it was, now I can appreciate the warden over there in Texas. She was a very nice lady. She was a Jewish, I think. She was a very nice lady. Uh, she gave me hot water, and she asking me if I can go walking or something, but, you know, sometimes I refused. Uh, I remember also, uh, yeah, two things. In the warden here in MDC, when I ask it here, I need is no hot water. I cannot take a shower without hot water. Uh, she hide herself and she showed the security to grab me, to put me in the shower because I was going to the court. Because I told her I'm going to tell the judge. She hide herself and she showed, I, I can see the faces, you know. I have experience, I can read the faces. You know, and they try to him, no, I don't. I go to the court like that, and I will keep myself like that. Uh, in Texas, the, the captain, he told me, don't expect we treat you as a human being. This is, I cannot remember this sentence. Don't expect we treat you as a human being. Later on, why, I, I really, I could not understand why he doing that, because he protecting his people outside the United States. I forgot to tell you, uh, I lost myself, or I go on the ground here in MEDC, and they take me to the hospital, and they sent to me one lieutenant and five guards, or four guards. The doctors try to treat me as a patient. I lost my everything, even I forgot everything. I could not even remember my name. And I almost died for maybe one hour. Uh, the lieutenant tried to keep to spread in the hospital. This guy, it caused American death out United States. You know, and he, when he talked with his captain, excuse my accent, I know I have a very bad accent, but you know, <laughs> I hope you understand me. And he, when he talked with his captain, he told him, don't worry, I will grab him, grab him again to MDC. You know me, and you sent the right person. Few months later, around maybe in March, I think, or February, the warden in Texas, she was a short lady, and she jumping in the window, and she told me, uh, Mr. Nicola, you was innocent. I knew that, but now all the world 
knows you are innocent. Your movie has nothing to do with the people get killed in Benghazi. And that day I was very, very happy and I felt, you know, something in my, you know, and I start to ask to go walking one hour a day, you know, in, in a special place. That's it. Yeah. When he was at the hearing that he just mentioned in September of uh, 2012, his attorney uh, was in a negotiating, negotiation process with the judge and with the prosecutor. And he was shocked when the prosecutor insisted on actually jailing Nakula. And he said, I thought we had a deal. He's not violent. He's not no risk of uh, flight or anything else. Why do we have to jail him? You said that if we could, maybe we could have him in house arrest or have him at home or wear an ankle bracelet or something like that so he can be with his family. And the prosecutor said, no, no, no. He's going to go to jail and he's going to go to MDC, the metropolitan district, the, 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 the jail here in Los Angeles. The attorney said, if he goes to MDC, he'll be a dead man because of the Muslim gangs in the jail. And the prosecutor just said, oh, well, tough luck, basically. And I believe that they wanted you to go out into the communal showers, and they wanted you to go out in the communal areas in the MDC, uh, so then you would not come back. No, That's it's, what, a, it's, a speci mm. no it's a special mm. place. Mm. It's a special shower, special everything. Mm. Everybody going alone mm. for that. This mm. is, uh, All right. Now, I want you to tell us a little bit about Egypt, growing up in Egypt. Yeah. And uh, 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 what, what was it that uh, you saw in Egypt that, uh, about being a Christian? What was it like to be a Coptic Christian in Egypt? Uh, were, were Coptic Christians persecuted? What was the relationship with Muslims? Okay, now I remember what, why I made this movie. It's a big question. My main reason for that is I like to save American get killed. I like to save blood. The, the main reason for this movie, it said, don't fight with the Muslims. Fight with the ideology. If you fight with the ideology, you save maybe it long way, yes, but it's a very, very successful. And if you fight with them, they kill you and you kill them. And if you kill them, the second day another one born, the second day another one born. But if you fight American, if you are American and you fight with the ideology, you can change their mind. They believe you cannot fight with someone he loved to get killed to go to the heaven and to 72 women over there. You cannot fight with him. If you kill him, his brother coming, his son brother, you know, from generation to generation. But if you fight with the ideology and you kill the ideology, never can burn any terrorists. This is, this is, it, this is the, the frame of the movie. This I like to say that, like for Israeli people, why you fight with Hamas and all of this is try to in try to take the ideology out, the ideas out. When you good died or you killed, you never find any 72 women over there. Never can be if they understand that, you know. I believe, or I still believe, we will save blood. This is the major thing for the movie. That's why I wrote this movie, I will start to think about other things. Okay, if you can preach, or if he can talk, you can hit and talk for one hour, two hours, 100 hours, but if you make this 100 hours for one drama, one hour drama, the people never forgot it. We listen to a lot of preachers, a lot of people, famous preachers, they can preach. But if you collect this is to one, or you can write book, this book, who can read this book? Not a lot of people. Some educated people, some people interested, and all of this. But I can put this book in one hour movie, or maybe less, a lot of people, they will watch it and they will remember the major sentence it's in this book. This is what I believe. That's why 
I collect everything I knew. I did read more than 3,000 book, Islamic book, more than 3,000 Islamic book, the major Islamic book, okay? But if I explain it to the people, they cannot believe it. If I can say, okay, uh, Muslim people, he can marry his daughter legally and with the Sharia if she is not or if he is not married legally his mother he can marry his daughter because he didn't marry her, her his her mother again if i am married and i have a girlfriend in the side and this girlfriend i have a daughter from here i can marry this daughter islamic sharia if I can explain it to you, maybe you can understand it. But when I put it in the movie, the people, what? Even Muslim people didn't know that. But this is in their box. The shiuch knew that. Okay. He can enjoy it with the... <coughs> That's why the, the lawyer for the other lady, the, the actor lady, fight with me. Okay. I, Islamic... The Muslim people, he can enjoy with the six years old or seven years old girl. They fight with, she. this is a sunnah, the box of sunnah, like Muhammad did. But for the Shia, he can enjoy it with the one year girl. They fight with them together. No, one year is enough. So no, six years is enough. That's why when I said he is a child molester, I asked her, what is the other experience? I have a bad English. I didn't born in England or United States, but I learned it. anybody touch any girl under the age, he is a child molester. Yes. When I went to the MDC and everything, the only people, they don't have any respect and they can be get killed inside the jail, the child molester. This is, you know, something normal. Okay, I try to do all these ideas in my movie. I try to put this one to make it shortcut to the public. Just a shortcut. The movie, we remember a lot of movies and we remember sentences in the movies long time ago. But we didn't remember the biggest, biggest people who in they spoke. This is what, what I believe. So was there something that happened to you as a young man in Egypt that convinced you of the evils of this ideology? Is there some personal experience that led you to get engaged in the way that you did? Actually, no, nothing happened. I was, when I was, since I was young, I was fight with the Muslim, play only with the Muslim kids. Fight with them, they hurt me, I hurt them, and that's it. But I watch a lot of people get hurt, especially in the, in AIDS, they start when Sadat took over. When Nasser was there, nobody can talk. Christian Muslims, nobody can even talk. Straightforward. When Sadat came, he grew up this Islamic group because Saudi Arabia start to put money inside Egypt. Saudi Arabia need to destroy Egypt. Period. They start, they start to send the money, money, and Sadat get happy because they cut the the oil from United States through the 73. Remember the shortage in 73 and 78? So that was happy, and the Muslim was happy because Saudi Arabia cut the oil for Europe and United States. Okay, after these times, I was in the college in, 80, in 70s. I thought a lot of things. I thought not myself, but I, I, I saw this is myself. Uh, after this, is, it's coming with the people get killed in, in Egypt by, after Sadat get killed. Uh, in 91 in Egypt, I heard about it. After this is coming to 98, 24 get killed in cities, you call it El Kosh. Uh, later on, September 11, when I saw the people in September 11, it was very bad. I get scared, 
about my generation, my kids. I came from Egypt. I left the Islamic countries and everything, but I came here to the United States. If this is, could be happened for my kids, for my generation, they follow us to here to the United States. They damaged these two towers, the biggest tower in, you know, it was scary. I start, I changing my name legally in 2002 from Nakula Basili Nakula to Mark Basili Yusuf. To cover my name when something happened, not Nakula, is Mark. Because I like to, I, I believe something could be big. I changed my name legally. They blame me in 2012 to put me in jail because I didn't tell them my name is Mark Yusuf. And they have my passport, my American passport. Until now, until this minute, they still have my American passport, Mark Basile Yusuf. But in 2012, even the judge or the US attorney, he didn't open the file to look to the passport. The passport is Mark Basile Yusuf. How are you telling me I didn't tell you? If you have my American passport, Mark Basile Yusuf. But you know, it's a reason, anyway. September 11 came after this is a lot of things happened in Egypt from 2000, uh, no, from 1991 until I released the movie and start to make the movie in 2010. I tried to put all this stuff in the movie. Two hours, never enough. I like to, my dream to make a serious TV movie. A series for 100 hours, 200 hours, and I have a material to cover these 200 hours. And all of it is truth, 100% truth, and from their box. Nobody can say, no, this is not in our box. No, in their box, not any box. The box, the student study these books in the Islamic University. Not any books from the street, the books from the, from the student, from the university. And here in my mind, more than 3,000 books. Now, some people have said, they, they looked at the movie, or at least the parts of it that are online, they say this is really terrible. Not that they don't like the message, but that it's badly produced, right? And um, uh, how, how did you actually come to make the, uh, the movie? How did you get the money to make the movie? Uh, would you have made it differently if you had more money? Okay. Uh, actually, the paper of the movie, the paper, this is the more important thing. That's why when I made a book, the, I put in the book just the script, the script of the movie. The script was written very good. It's reviewed by the people, you know, the no. English more than me. Actually, the director, he reviewed it with me. And uh, when we start to hire a people, he, de he did the editing, the, the production. He start to interview the actors and all of this. I put in my mind in that time, this movie could be, doesn't, it, worse or doesn't cost too much money. But in my belief, I don't think any, any movie going to 10 millions or more of the viewer. I don't think so. Advertising, the advertising, it made it, Mrs. Clinton made it free for me. Right. <laughs> free, 100%. I really appreciate that. Okay. And uh, I don't think even if you have millions of dollars to spend it for this movie, I don't think it makes that famous like that. Maybe, I put in my mind, this movie, two hours. If some big producer watches the whole movie, they cannot produce the whole movie because the movie is a lot of stories. But if, I'm, if I have money, I will take part from this movie to make big movie. The other part, make another movie. The other part, make another movie. You know, not all the, the two hours, because the two hours is a, a lot of stories, from jumping from story to story. I like to put more information or more, 
yeah, more information for this one. You know, but of course, if I have money, I will make a serious movie, more than 200 hours. Okay, now, just to, just to make sure that we all understand what, what he's just told you, all of the scenes in the movie are authentic scenes from the life of Muhammad, the, 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 the scenes that take place in the past where you have Muhammad, he's called Master George in the mixed version, but all of those are authentic scenes from the life of Muhammad. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. All right, that's right. so this is something that people have kind of missed, I think, in, in the public. Uh, they've said it's blasphemy Islam, but in fact, it is Islam, yes, right? I like to say what the major question in the movie, why you fight with the Muslim? That's why I said innocence of Muslim. This Muslim, they are very good. I know a lot of friends, Muslims, very, very nice people, better than the Christian, believe me, or some of the Christian, believe me. But once he opened his book and read, he transferred automatically to terrorists. That's why I look, fight with the ideology, fight with the book, fight with the ideas, not with the person it's himself. No, 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 no. Don't fight with himself. If we catch, okay. Why Osama bin Laden terrorist? One day I put the, the address of the movie, Innocence of Bin Laden. Mm -hmm. It's a question, why he is terrorist? Why? Because he like to kill, he like blood. The human being, I don't think any human being like that, but he did read or he read in his book, if he kill non-Muslim, he go to heaven. Who, who is, all of us need to go to heaven. Everybody here need to go to heaven. But how? With the prey, with doing favors for the people, we take care of the poor people, we take care like, like the Bible said? No. Kill non-Muslim. That's it. Kill non-Muslim. The ladies is nothing. Females is nothing. Sorry, garbage for the Muslim? No. No, no, no. They said that I did read in the... Don't go in the streets with your wife like that or with lady like that. This is you look like the non-Muslim. But put a, uh, a rope in her neck and grab her in the streets. This is you are a Muslim because you grab your lady from the neck by the rope to the street. This is this is idea. This is box. This is the this is, call it religion. I don't think religion can say that. I did read the Torah, the Old Testimony. No, 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 no. It has something, yes, but with the explanation, I can understand it. But for the Quran, no, no. Kill non Muslim. Okay, if you grab the Quran, believe me, believe me, from this page to this page, you found the killing, ribbing, sex, that's it. You never find the love. Never find the love. Never. Love, word love, no. You never find it in the Quran. Not love your enemy, no, <laughs> even don't love yourself. <laughs> now, I, I went and interviewed a number of the actors and actresses in the movie, and uh, as you watch the movie, you can see that sometimes the actors uh, turn it into derision. In other words, they do not take it seriously and they almost play it as if it is a parody, not a serious thing. From what I understood in speaking to them, you did not play a very active role on the set. You let your director play an active role. Do you think you might have made a better movie if you had been more engaged and talked to the actors and actresses more okay. so they could understand what it was all about? Okay. The movie, it has 79 actors. 79 actors. Okay. Because I take the whole life, the major person is Muhammad, or we call him George. The other people just say few sentences. And I put the script on the site. If somebody likes to read it, he can read it. But no one read it. No one. He just came to do the, the shot and take the money and go. That's all. That's why they didn't even bother to read what is that. Okay. Uh, yes, but my language doesn't help me. 
Uh-huh. If if I can direct, sometimes I try to tell them something, mm-hmm. but you know it's okay. My, the major thing is my sentence. It's on the screen. Mm-hmm. That's it. This is it was my 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 consideration for that. My words on the screen. My words in their lab. That's I like the message sent it to the people. Okay. Uh, perhaps uh, questions. Do we want to take some questions from the audience? If uh, people uh, here who have, uh, how many of you have actually seen the movie *Innocence of Muslim* or seen a, a piece of it? Okay, so most of you have, and and you you understand that what I was saying about the actors and the actresses—they don't really seem to be taking it very seriously, uh, and and they didn't seem to really understand the importance of what of what your message was, right? And I think that's very different when you read the script. Mm-hmm. I think the message comes through a lot more. On, on, on the page with the script than it does in the movie. Uh, are there people who would, um, questions here from the audience? Well, okay, Bill, for- Hang on a second, let me get the mic. Okay. We gotta use a wireless mic here, so give me a little bit of patience. <laughs> okay, Nikula? Yes, sir. Good to see you again. Thank you. Um, what's it feel like to be the first free speech martyr for Islamic blasphemy in this country. I think that's a, a badge of honor that you should proudly wear. What's it feel like? Actually, I didn't put in my mind how, you know, someday I will be famous. I never thought about that. I just think about something is, I like to protect this country. This country, when I came to United States, I came with $100, $100 when I came here in the United States. You know, someday I was running four gas stations, own four gas stations. One of them, I own the property. Okay, I get a lot of things. I have three kids, uh, plus the oldest one, his best away in 1998, but I still have three kids. Two of them, they will be doctors or you know, in the medical schools, and the one, uh, she studies the magister, or the master degree now. Okay, uh, you know, it's, I'm good, I'm better. If I was in Egypt, I don't think. I have a master degree for agriculture engineering. I finished in uh, Alexandria University. But if I stayed in Egypt, I never been like that. That's why this country gave me a lot. This country, my kids they will growing up, they will be, of course, better than me. Uh, I'm here happy with the ho- in the homeless shelter in this church. I'm very happy. I live very simple life, very simple life. You know, they give me housing, they give me uniforms, they give me food, they give me everything. I'm happy with that because I own everything. I tried everything. I take airplanes with the first class. I went to seven star hotels. I tried everything, but believe me, it's nothing, zero. You know where is I discover the happiness? The happiness when you try to protecting the people or helping the other people. You feel more happiness than anything else. When you're helping the poor people, when you're helping the kids, the handicapped people have special needs or all of that, this is really the happiness. This is what I believe in, in my uh, mind, in my heart. That's why I didn't think I will be famous someday. In breaking the news, my, my picture, in the breaking the news, what is that? Who am I? I'm nothing, nothing. And all the people, they say, so where is Regan? Where is Nixon? Where is Kennedy? Where is uh, Eisenhower? Where is all these people? Under the ground. Nothing. Nothing. The only thing is staying with you is your good faith job. This is what I believe. That's why when they put me and they say, okay, you are a first prisoner for the freedom of speech and all of this is... It's nothing make me uh, very proud or very happy or anything. No. My major thing is protect this country. This country is not, you know, really, I don't like to see them someday, women get killed or kids get killed, like what's happened in 
in Boston, in uh, September 11, in France. I don't want that because I already touched in Egypt or my people touched in Egypt. That's it. I hope I can answer the question. Um, I had a couple of questions. Just what you were Coptic Christian growing up? You were Coptic Christian now? No, I born a Coptic Christian. Uh -huh. I born. Um, All my family is Coptic Christian. Oh, okay. And you're a Christian now? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Also, um, what is your status? What is your situation? You're still living here apart from your family? Or no, I'm, no, I'm here. I'm living alone here. My family and my kids and everybody is, you know, they're coming to visit me. Sometimes I go to visit them, and that's it. Are you still in having legal problems with the government? Yes, or? yes. Oh. I still have legal problems until September next year. Oh. I hope if they doesn't continuously it or anything happens. Oh. But your family After this meeting, maybe they can do something. You get to see your... In reference to the legal side of it, he is on probation. If you go to WikiLeaks or you go to anywhere, you can find out he's on probation. And back three years ago, he was assigned to a probation officer. Wiley Dre, which blew me away because they were chasing me all over the place. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, he does have a fatwa on him. Mm -hmm. And we have been notified that uh, they indeed have a fatwa on me now. Mm -hmm. uh, not as big as his, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. That's fine. No, it's, uh, this is what's happened. You know, in September 11, or September 27, take 26 next year. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's, uh, I can go, I can travel, I can go anywhere, you know. If they didn't do anything against me, after Mrs. Clinton coming to the White House, like I believed. Yeah, and, and by the way, that's five years of probation. Four. Four years. Four years. Four, Four years. Four years of probation yes. after the year that you were in prison. 13, yeah. For a parole violation. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You got that, folks? Yeah. yeah. Four, year, four years probation, right? Yeah. A year in jail for a yeah. parole violation. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Uh, other, other questions here? Yes. Can you say when we get there, my... Yeah. my question is, uh, you know, are, you, are you concerned? Well, we know what happened with Hillary, and uh, her lies are documented. Are you, how concerned are you now with? running for the presidency and possibly even becoming the president of the United States. Now, does that frighten you or where do you? Not a possibility. The, she is 99.9% .9 she will be your future president. Take my word. 99% she is your future president. That's but a very high number. Why do you think it's no, that high? No, it is not high. It's, it's less than whatever it's supposed to be, and, and this doesn't make me, doesn't make difference for me. What she will do for me? Get killed? So what? I get, put me in jail? <laughs> I tried this before. That's me and it has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with me. But I'm sure she will be. I'm sorry to say that. <laughs> <laughs> but I see that. But those could be very good odds if you have the right person on your side. <laughs> other, other questions? I have a question. Uh, we've talked a lot about Hillary today. Um, how much is Obama involved in this? How much did he know about the deception? How much was he uh, a moving force in trying to hide this Benghazi uh, event? I said that before. Uh, President Obama is a commander of a chief of the United States. I cannot criticize him. Once he get out, maybe I can say something. But once he is a commander of a chief of the United States, I cannot say nothing. Can you say something, Mr. Timmerman? <laughs> uh, well, we don't know exactly what Obama was doing on the night of the attacks. All right? Uh, we know that he was preparing for a fundraiser in Las Vegas the next day. We know the, the, that he had a meeting uh, at 5 o'clock with the Secretary of Defense uh, and when he was informed, he was briefed by the Secretary of Defense about what was going on in Benghazi and he told them, and Leon Panetta has testified to this repeatedly, do, you know, 
You, you guys handle it. I don't want to know. You guys handle it. Uh, about two weeks ago, the White House, uh, uh, the State Department logs were released for that night for the operations center of the State Department. And there is only one communication from the President to the Secretary of State the entire day. And you see everybody calling. Dennis McDonough from the White House is calling. Ben Rhodes is calling. And these calls are patched through to Hillary Clinton. And you could see this minute by minute who's calling and who's talking to who and whatever. There's only one communication from the President of the United States. And it actually took place after her statement to the American people at around 10.20. Her statement was at uh, 10.08. So it took place around 10.20, a communication from the president. I'd always thought it was just before uh, the, um, uh, the statement. But that's it. And after that, Obama goes dark. We know he was never in the Situation Room. Never. Never. Americans are being killed at a diplomatic outpost overseas, and the president of the United States did not think that was important enough to personally show up in the Situation room and exercise his duties as commander-in-chief. Well, that leads us to the next question then. Do you have any theory or any basis for why they didn't bother to send a rescue team? Was that a specific decision that was made or were they just uh, incompetent? I think that decision was made by Mrs. Clinton. The stand-down order came from Mrs. Clinton. It did not come from the White House. As far as Obama was concerned, they were in charge. I'm, I'm not the commander in chief. I don't know what to do. He's an amateur when it came to the military. He didn't have a clue. Then what was the motive for the stand down order? So the stand down order was, uh, you have to understand where Mrs. Clinton was coming from. And I can say this without implicating you. you know, these are my words here, not Nicola's words. But uh, Mrs. Clinton detested the military, hated the military with a passion. Remember when she was first lady, she refused to salute. She swore at them, the Marine Guard. I interviewed on many, many occasions the head of Chris Stevens, Ambassador Stevens' security detail in Tripoli, uh, Colonel Andy Wood. He was, a, he was a Green Beret colonel, a Special Forces guy. And he told me that they had orders from the State Department, from the State Department, that they were ne never, his 18-man special forces security detail, they were never supposed to leave the embassy compound in uniform, not even their boots. That's, those were the words he used, not even our boots, because Hillary Clinton did not want boots on the ground. And her message was, and she made this clear, it was loud and clear to everybody who served in Libya, uh, we are not the George W. Bush administration. We do not come in to a foreign country, guns a-blazing. The Marines are not going to land on the shores of Tripoli. We lead from behind, and, it's, and at any rate, it's the Libyan government's responsibility. So I don't, that, that, is not a, that is not an acceptable answer, but I believe that that is as close to the truth as we're ever going to get. Yes, sir. <laughs> Do we know where Hitlery was that night when she left those men to, to die in Benghazi? Do we know geographically where she was? Uh, for most of the time, I believe we do. She was uh, at, the, at the State Department at least until uh, 10 o'clock. So she was in that secure video teleconference with people in the White House between 7.30 p.m. Uh, Washington time, 9.30 p.m. Washington time. And what, to what time did the attack start, the Washington attack, time? Washington time, the attack started at 3.42 p.m. Okay. All right. And they went on for 13 hours. Okay. So they, they continued on until 4 a.m., uh, you know, basically, well, no, not 4 a.m., but it was, it was, uh, about 5 a.m. local in Benghazi, so it was uh, 11 p.m. Uh, uh, Washington time. Um, after the secure video teleconference and her, um, uh, her statement at 10.08, I believe she went home. And you have on the, on the State Department operations uh, logs, you have other people in her office who are then 
issuing orders, they're channeling through communications, they're talking to Greg Hicks and whatever, but she drops off at, from the State Department. I believe she went home and had additional conversations, but from her home, up until about 11 o'clock or, or midnight, then she went to bed. And, but other people watched through the night. Some of her aides, I, you know, they watched through the night. It was their duty for crying out loud, but they did watch through the night. She did not. Wow. And we know that now. We know that now from the logs. We did not know that uh, as a fact until about two weeks ago. So, I, Nicola, thank you very much for questions? this. And it was a pleasure to be with you. Thank you all for being here. And now I'll turn it back to uh, Bill Becker from Freedom X. You know, you're special people because you're here. Where are, where's the rest of Orange County today, you know? This uh, message got out to a lot of lists, and I'm frankly surprised because I feel edified listening to this today, and I hope you did too. Um, as I say, Freedom X is a nonprofit. We're trying to do something that others aren't doing. We need funding, we need large donors, so if you could spread the word about us, I'd appreciate it, because we'd like to be back and we'd like to see sizable crowds for the events we're gonna do. They're not just gonna be boring events where just one speaker speaks or you have a panel discussion. We're trying to think out of the box and to uh, bring to the attention of people uh, issues and personalities that are um, not commonplace not orthodox. So I hope you'll spread the word and also stay in touch with us. Um, I've written a, the first installment of a book that I'm investigating regarding Islamic indoctrination in K through 12 public schools. It's called American Madrasas. And um, I've done a lot of research here and in Tennessee and around the country. Um, and I'm gonna be finishing this book, but I need some support for that too. I really hope you'll pick up a copy. We're asking for a minimum donation of $5. If you want to pay more, you can. But uh, $5, and it's a good, fast read, and I want to finish the book sometime in the next year. Now, we're going to allow Ken to sign his books for those who would like them signed. If Nikula left, I was hoping he'd stick around to sign them as well. Uh, I don't know if somebody can grab him, but... Um, uh, in any event, uh, have your book signed and introduce yourself to me if you haven't already. And uh, thank you so much for coming today.
Yeah, we 